Thank you, Diana. You read that so well. I don't have to go through the whole thing again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to be back, being able to share the word of God with you this morning. Keep your Bibles open to John. And let's look a little deeper into some of these verses. Jesus said that he is what? The good? Now, because we don't live in a society that keeps a lot of sheep, sometimes we don't understand what this means. But for a sheep, is it important to have a good shepherd? Yes. Why? Because they're prone to wonder. Yes. They're prone to get in trouble. Yes. But listen, this is the great thing about sheep, is that a sheep will know his shepherd's voice. And he will know the voice, and he won't come to another voice, but he will know his shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd, and we are those sheep. We are prone to wonder, prone to get in trouble, but yet we need to know the good shepherd's voice so that when we hear it, we respond to it. The title of this message today is The Depth of God's Love. All of us in this room somehow, some way, have felt love, right? May not be as deep as what we have hoped for, what we wanted, but all of us somehow, some way, have felt a measure of depth of love. Sometimes it's hard, I know as a pastor, it's very hard to try to explain to you the depth of God's love. Because you're talking about things that you don't see, you can't touch. But if you know it, you can feel it. And you can feel that God is real bad, the depth of His love for you. But I want you to think about this. Jesus is the Good Shepherd. How many of you have ever had dogs? Raise your hand. Now this only works with dogs, it will not work with cats. Because cats are a neat breed of critics. <laughs> There are good dogs and there are bad dogs. Have you guys ever had a bad dog? Yeah, you know, a bad dog. You try to train him and the dog just will not learn, does not want to learn, and just does what he wants. And usually what he wants is bad. Like, chew on your walls. Or chew on your shoes. Or chew on your couch. Or chew on anything that he's not supposed to. Or pee on his car. There you go. Yes. Sometimes you have to make a choice when you realize that this dog just is not going to get any better. You either choose to continue to keep that dog. There are a lot of people that says, we'll just get another one. But see now, think about it. We're that kind of dog. Right? How many of you in this room give 100% obedience to your master? You? Think about it. You ever do anything wrong? Yeah, see, me too. Isn't that what you require from your dog? Maybe not 100% obedience, but at least maybe 50, 60, 70. But listen, if you all ever had a good dog, and I mean a really good dog, you know, the dog that, that you swear dogs know your language. It could be English, it could be Chinese. It can be anything, but whatever you say, that dog knows. And, and it's not like you're giving commands to an animal. You can actually have conversations with the dog, and the dog responds to you. That's a good dog. Okay? Now, I've had dogs that would give you 100% obedience once they became mature dogs. And there's nothing like that kind of relationship. Okay? Think about it. How many of us do the same for our master? And our creator. Now think about it. Are you smarter than a dog? Okay. 
All of you here, I will attest that you're smarter than dogs. I have met some humans that, uh, that's questionable. But think about the intelligence that God has given you. Think of all the things that you have been blessed to be able to learn, to experience, and yet are you as faithful as a dog to your master, to your creator, to the God who has given everything to you? I want you to understand the depth of God's love. See, because there are many people who when they get a dog, it's a bad dog, they just get rid of that dog. How many times have you seen stray dogs in your neighborhood and you're wondering, where did he come from? And you look at the poor thing and the dog has a collar, may have a tag, but it's abandoned. I was driving down the road one day and this is a shepherd mix, cutest, it was still a puppy, but it's full grown. But it was standing right at a four-way stop sign. And every time a truck came by, a truck, not a car, but a truck, it would stand up on its hind legs to look in the window. Do you know why? Because the master owned a truck and dumped him off. And I was looking for its master, and every truck that went by, it would get excited, its tail would wag, and look up into that truck. And the truck would drive off, and the dog would just sit down again. And I watched this dog. I realized the dog was going to end up getting hit by a car. So my mother loved dogs. And she lost her dog. And she told me she didn't want another one. That was a loss. <laughs> she told me that, but I didn't believe her. So we saw this dog. And like I said, it was a German Shepherd, so it was a mix. But it was going to be a good-sized dog and be a good protector for her. She lived by herself. So I knew that if I took this dog to her house and just let her see it and let the dog be nice like he was, that's all it would take. And sure enough, took the dog to the house and listen, we looked, we went to the police department to see if anybody uh, lost this dog. The dog's looking for its owner and they just dumped the dog off. And it took all of about maybe three minutes for her to bond with this dog. Now listen, the dog that she lost, she used to clean houses at that time. And so she was cleaning this house, and she came out and she had to get uh, some stuff, some materials out of her car to help her clean the house. In the back of her car, sitting down at the back of the car, was this, man, this was an ugly dog. It was a mixture between a lapso apso and like a dachshund. <laughs> so it was really long, furry, and had legs about this tall. I'll tell you, dogs understand English, whatever language you speak. She looked at that dog and she goes, man, I don't want another dog. But the dog wasn't going in because the dog can smell from the car that she was that lady. You know what I'm saying? That lady, that I can smell you're a good lady and you love animals. And I know that if I come home with you, my life will be perfect. <laughs> so she pets this dog, and it's all Teddy. She pets this dog, she tells the dog, she says, If you want to come home with me, you're going to have to sit here until I clean this house. And if you're here when I come out, I'll take you home. <laughs> this was the conversation she had with a dog. <laughs> Dog sat down, she went and did her stuff. She came out, and you know where that dog was? Yeah. Sitting right there, didn't move. And when she opened that car door, you know what that dog did? Yeah. Jumped right in, like, Aww. I own the place. <laughs> she had that dog for many, many, many years, and that's the dog that died, and then we replaced it with, with this one. But I want you to think about, like I said, the loyalty that that animal shows. And again, put it on a human level, and what kind of loyalty do we show our Creator? Mm -hmm. The difference with our Creator is if we're not obedient, if we're not good, He doesn't dispose of us. Mm -hmm. right? He doesn't throw us out to hopefully be found by somebody nice. But listen, this Creator, this God who made us, tells us the truth. And the truth is, is that we all have sinned, and we all have fallen short of the glory of God. 
But not only that, not only have we fallen, but we have actually become enemies of God. Amen. Isn't that what the book of Romans tells us? Yes. Good to see you, my friend. New face, good to see you. So listen, this God, I have to get my thoughts on <laughs> Anyway, again, the book of Romans tells us that while we were enemies, Christ died for us. Is that right? The death of God's love. Turn with me again to John. Let's look, chapter 10. Verse 14, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know who? I know my sheep. And not only that, but my sheep know me. That's important, okay? Because there are many voices, and there are many distractions out there that will try, you, or try to draw you away from the good shepherd. You've got to be able to discern and hear his voice from all the other noise in the world. As the Father knows me, this is verse 15, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now listen, verse 16. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will what? How would these other sheep know his voice? Because he's their shepherd too. Listen. When God created Adam and Eve, did he create them in his image? Absolutely. Alright. So before the fall, we were created in the image of God. And even after the fall, we still had that image. And that is what the devil has been trying to smear and wipe out from humanity. But in all of us it is still the image of God. And this is why God's depth of his love would go to the greatest lengths possible to save each and every one of us. Think about that. Now, Ray, you were talking about this morning, you must have had a good Sabbath school class. Uh, what was it that hit you so hard? We were talking about you know the greatest sermon on the creek, which is Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and really to conclude that, it was basically it's about loving others, you know, and not despising others and being self-righteous. I mean, it, it, our relationship with God may be okay, but what about our relationship with our brothers and sisters? You know, even if somebody is doing everything wrong, you know, if I despise this person, what good am I? Mm. What good am I? Doesn't the Bible also tell you that if you do not have love and you don't love your brothers, then you don't know God? What I want you to think about this morning is how much God loves you. Not the world, not the church, but you individually. And that this God who runs the entire universe, now how much power is that? All could you take your phone right now and get a one-on-one -on -one call with the governor of Florida? Probably not. Probably not. Maybe. Seriously. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to give him a campaign donation. <laughs> no, it has to be a big one to get him one-on-one. -on -one. Think about this. Could you actually call the principal of your local high school, get him on the phone right now one-on-one, -on -one, if you did not know him? And yet, this God who is made everything, is in charge of everything, you're able to talk with Him at any place, at any time, and He will hear your voice. Amen. Amen. I want you to think about that. Now, I want you to think about this. Would you ever have the opportunity to one-on-one -on -one talk with the President of the United States? Possibly. Possibly. But you can talk to your Creator any time. Why? He's made himself available. Okay. Now, if I'm a sinner and I'm an enemy of God, then why would this God want to talk to me? Because he loves me, right? 
as he loves me. Turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. Let's look at verses 33 and 34. Jesus is telling his disciples, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer, and you will see me. And as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, verse 34, what? Everybody knows this. A new commandment I give you. What's that, com what's that commandment? That you love one another as I have loved you. That you love one another. Now listen, who's he talking to here? He's talking to his disciples. When he said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, who was he talking to? Why? Because they still didn't like each other. They'd been around each other for years, and they still had problems. Now listen, you get a group of people, and one of those people is a zealot, and the other one's a tax collector, you're going to have problems. Right? And yet Jesus was able to, for three and a half years, bring them together and stop them from killing each other. But now he was going away, right? He tells them that I leave you a new commandment. And that commandment is that you what? Love, love one another. Was it really a new commandment? No. But no. you think about this. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? What did he say? All your mind, all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. What's the next one? Your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Now, was that new? No. He was quoting Leviticus. Okay? It's Old Testament. Love is not new. It's not something you find just only in the New Testament. This is who and what God is. And because God is love, this is what we need to be because we're made in His image, right? Now listen. The reason why I talk to you a little bit about this image of God that we're created in. When Adam and Eve sinned, and the devil was allowed to mar that image, and sin continued to mar it throughout the centuries. When Christ came, He came to restore that image, right? When Jesus left us an example. And did he leave us an example? Oh, absolutely. Okay. When we are born again, is that supposed to change anything? Yes. What does it change? That's good. It changes your heart, right? What does it change in your heart? Does I, do I get a new valve? If I have a plug there, it kind of lets the plug go and, and my heart works again? Okay, very good, right? Yeah, it's your whole point of what you're saying about loving one another. He upped the ante. It wasn't about me just expressing expressing a love like, you know, uh, physically working it out. But in my heart, there's a change, there's a difference. See, even though this person that I'm dealing with is completely wrong, I don't despise them in my heart. I pray for them. I love them. See, what you just said is true. This is one of the greatest examples of what this change will do for you. Jesus said, what good or profit is it if you just love your friends? Don't even the tax collectors do that? Yeah. Right? I love people who are like me. I love people who love me. But if you don't love me, I don't have to love you then. Right? But what Jesus does is come into your heart. And now he changes you. And he gives you the power to love to really love like he loves. Now, does Jesus love you only if you're good? No. Does Jesus love you only if you obey him? Because no. if that was the criteria, none of us here would meet that. And we would have serious problems. Okay? But this is the love of God. That God loves unconditionally. It took me a long time to figure out what that meant. My wife knew. And she's the one that actually showed me what that meant. And it, she showed me it in, in loving my children. Okay? Because I love my children, and I would do anything for them. But I love them more when they did what was right. You know what I'm saying? She loved them no matter what. And, and they could tell the difference between the two. They knew that that, that was me. If you wanted me to be 
happy with you, then meet the criteria. You know what I'm saying? You didn't have to meet anything, she just loved you. That took me a long time to learn how to do that. And I couldn't do it in myself, but that's what Christ does in you. You understand what I'm saying? So getting back to John, we looked at chapter 13, 33, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Turn one more chapter over to John 14. Here again, Jesus gives words of comfort and hope. John 14, verse 1. It's another verse that everybody knows what it said. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 2, we love this one. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And do what? Receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Listen, this God, this Savior, doesn't just control the universe and a couple days out of the week he turns his attention to us. <coughs> but he has been waiting and longing for the day when he can bring you home. Don't you want to go home? Yeah. Don't you want to live in a place where there is no more tears, no more death, no more suffering? Amen. Don't you want to live in a place where you don't have to lock your door? Amen. Where you don't have to lock your car? Amen. Where you don't have to worry about somebody stealing and robbing and killing you? Don't you want to live in a place where you know that when your daughter goes out at night, she's going to be safe? Amen. Don't you want to live in a place where you can see the glory of God face to face? Amen. Look upon your Savior. You can go up to Him and hug Him. What's the greatest thing you want out of heaven? The thing I want is to be able to hug Jesus. And to be hugged back. That's love. You know, it's like, there, there are people, <clears throat> there are people who are good huggers. There are some people, who, that's how they make their living. They hug people. Did you know that? New York City, other big cities, what they do, they help people. Because people need hugs, right? There are some people who give really good hugs, and that when they hug you, you just, you know what I'm saying? What's it going to be like when you're able to stand face to face with your Savior? Right? See Him, see the love in His eyes for you, and know that you're finally home. Again, John 14, let's look at verses 23 and then 27. John, did you want to, could you insert uh, 6, John 14, 6? Do you have that? You want to read it, Gary? Yeah. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's that's, the truth. that's pretty plain, isn't it? He's the truth. And the life. Listen. I've met a lot of people, talked to a lot of people who think that I'm very narrow-minded because I believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But when you understand the true problem of sin, that sin has separated you from your God, that you cannot and will never be able to make yourself clean again in His sight, that there's nothing you're going to do, no way you're going to act that's going to get rid of all that sin, that you either stand in your sin in the presence of a holy God, or you pray to God for somebody to take your place. Amen. Right? Mm -hmm. Jesus has to be the only way. Because if there was three, four, or a thousand different ways, you would have never had to die. I could have a whole lot easier life. You know what I'm saying? And the devil wouldn't be attacking me so much. Amen? Amen. Right? Amen. Jesus is the way because he was the only one who could pay for your sin. Did angelic perfection uh, prove true and worthy in heaven? Absolutely not. Okay, so angels couldn't die for your sins. Okay, because they fell themselves. This is why God 
had to come in the flesh. What does the word Emmanuel mean? God with us. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was. And the same was in the beginning with God. Skip down a few verses. It says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is that Word? Jesus. The reason why Jesus as God came is because His perfection as God, and then He came as a man, and Jesus was fully God and fully man, and He did not use His divinity to overcome sin, Amen. and so He was the perfect man, and He became my substitute. So my imperfections, He gives me His perfection. My sin, He gives me His sinlessness. He is my all and all. And he's the only one that can do that. This is why he said, and he, he didn't he didn't try to hide it, did he? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Now listen. He said prior to that in John that those who have come before me, he's talking about being a good shepherd. He says those who have come before me are thieves and robbers. Why? Because any other way to try to find salvation, whoever is teaching that way is a thief and a robber. Because you're not going to find your way to God through that. So John 14, 1 through 3, we read that. Let's look at verses 23 and 27. Jesus then answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will what? Keep my, Keep my word. And my Father will love him and will come to him and make what? Our home with him. Our home with him. How, does, how does God make his home with us? How does that happen? Jesus said, it is for your benefit that I go. Because if I go, I will send another comforter. Again, this is in the Gospel of John. Okay? A few chapters before we'll be reading. And that comforter will live inside of you. Who is this other comforter? The Holy Spirit. Is, is, is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. In the Old Testament, when the Jews wanted to meet God, where did they go? The to the tabernacle or the sanctuary, right? Or the temple. Three different words for the same place. Okay? <laughs> because the presence of God was there in the tabernacle, in the sanctuary, in the most holy place, between the, uh, the two angels' wings, right? We had the Shekinah presence, the Shekinah glory. That was the presence of God. Now listen. What Jesus has done for us is he's made us the temple of God. You guys understand that? Yeah. Don't you know that you are the temple of God? What does that mean? Don't Anybody mean have an idea? What that means now is that God is able to dwell in you, with you, all the time. Now i got a question for you. Let's see if any of you have an answer for this. Jesus said that he was the Son of God. Is that right? The scribes and the Pharisees wanted to stone him. And again, in the Gospel of John, he asked them, Why do you want to stone me? Isn't it written in your law that you are God's? What does that mean? They were silent as well. <laughs> Was he teaching pantheism? No, the laws of God. Jesus said, Doesn't it say in your law that you are God's? 